All right, Nathan Felix is a composer and music director, a classical composer and musical director for From Those Who Follow the Echoes. That is a local street choir that whistles, that reimagines and reactivates public spaces. Now, in is a 2017 transplant just this year. He grew up in Austin, toured internationally as a guitarist before getting the itch to compose for orchestra. And now he is a self-taught composer. His symphonies have been premiered in Bulgaria, Portugal, Denmark, Mongolia, as well as across the United States. And his music has been featured on, it looks like all kinds of fake news. You got uh, BBC, <laughs> MTV, NPR, lamestream media, PBS. Please give it up for Nathan Felix, making the big entrance. So I am a bit of a noob to San Antonio, but I'm, thank you, um, trying to represent, I feel, I feel the love, so, um, but yeah, I'm part of the Austin Exodus, or that will soon be the Austin Exodus. Um, I wanted to be one of the first people that I could say, like, oh, I, was, I left Austin first, so. Um, so growing up in Austin, um, I have fallen in love with music because everybody there plays music so I'm going to talk about music and following the music all right I forget I can see it here this is me at 15 with dreams of basketball stardom it's the same year I would tear the tendons in my knee the day I made varsity with little mobility I randomly picked up a guitar and I fell in love with music I spent 13 hours a day practicing while elevating my leg and thus began a new dream of a rock and roll lifestyle I was ready to pack up for L.A. to pursue my dream upon graduating. At the end of my senior year, I was offered an academic scholarship to the University of Texas, and my mom insisted I further my education and go to L.A. after college. So in college, I, lo <clears throat> I felt lost, and I played in horrible cock rock bands, but what I didn't realize at the time, I was searching for my musical identity. So as I, as I was wrapping up my advertising degree at UT, I was back at square one with, without a band. I confided in a family friend that I needed to continue practicing in order to be ready to fully pursue my dream. And his response to me has stuck with me ever since. He said, do it now, sometimes later becomes never. So the first thing I did was call two of my best friends and my brother, and I told them, we're going on tour. None of them had ever played an instrument or owned any audio equipment. <laughs> But I told them that I would buy their instruments and teach them. I thought if the Ramones could play three chords, that we could play four. <laughs> so three months later, we were playing locally in Austin as the little blokes, but it was more fun than good at this point. But I met a lot of local musicians, and one day Franklin Morris, a member of the Murdochs, who we were big fans of, called and asked if I was interested in booking for a music touring agency. I immediately said yes, and so began my first foray into the music industry, and this is my first lesson in saying yes to everything and then figuring things out along the way. So. I booked my band for the bands that I was booking, and three months later we were on our first national tour. So, during these three adventurous years of non-stop touring, I made friends all over the country and I experienced a lot of growth as I reassessed my attitudes about travel, music, friendship, and life goals. And early on we noticed that if we played a major market like New York or LA, that oftentimes there was little to no crowd, but if we played the smaller markets in the south, we had huge crowds of hungry kids who would dance along and buy all of our merch. So, after three years on the road, tension was high. Our label called us and said that we had set up a showcase that was going to change our lives. And we just needed to be in Austin in two days. We were in Boston. So that 30-hour drive was the final straw, and it changed my life. To cut the tension, I switched the radio to a classical music station, and it began to captivate my mind. And I was hooked on classical music. So we played that showcase for Indie Rec Records, and nothing happened. So fortunately for me, my brother, he bought into my newfound love for classical music. He took me to see my first ever symphony at 25 years old, and he taught me about this guy, Philip Glass. So we decided to form a band that would sound like a symphony. So we placed an ad on Craigslist, and it was open to anyone who played any instrument or that was willing to learn because I was going to teach them, remember? <laughs> so. And with that, the Noise Revival Orchestra was born. We became a fully functioning rock orchestra with 13 committed members. On the flip side, this meant I had to now write for music instruments like trumpet, trombone, flute, tuba, violoncello, and saxophone, even though I had no clue the difference between a treble and bass clef. So I just hummed everyone's parts, and they wrote it down for me. So 
A few years in, we got a break when MTVU, they asked to film and feature us on a new series ahead of the curve, with the likes of Santa Gold and the White Stripes. So thinking we are on the verge of our big break, we went into the studio to record a new single. And wanting to make the best possible track, I brought in some outside studio musicians. And this decision immediately divided the group. Half the band quit, and I sunk into depression. But with time on my hands, I began st sculpting my first full work for Symphony, which took me four years to complete. And in the end, I had a six movement, 30 minute work, and now I just needed an 80 piece orchestra to play it. <laughs> so I looked up every orchestra in the world and every organi organization that funded composers, and I typed out a unique letter to each of them explaining how amazing it was. And the result, and this is where we insert the crickets chirping sound, but in actuality, I received hundreds of responses, albeit in the form of rejection letters, so it felt like a waste of time. Feeling lost, I received a random email with an invitation to a songwriting camp in Denmark, as you see here, and an ensuing tour. They asked if I had a band. I said, yes, and I picked up my guitar again. Excuse me. After Europe, I was invited to tour China, so my symphony was pretty much an afterthought. But a conductor in New York, he reached out. He wrote that he had heard my story of playing rock music, writing a symphony that no one wanted to play, and he related. <laughs> so he invited me to record my first symphony in New York, and I thought this could be my chance to become a real-life composer. So, in New York, we had one day to set up, one day to rehearse, and one day to record. The night before recording, we caught wind of a huge party, and the next morning, the players started stumbling in, hungover, no joke. Many didn't even show up, so I freaked out, and I thought, this is just a waste of time. The remaining players, they put their hearts and souls into it, and what we got was what we got that day, but I didn't have time to listen to it because I was off to China. So China was insane. Our first show in Shanghai, we opened for a well-known local band and played to a packed house, and I figured that based on this one show alone, that I'd be satisfied with the trip, no matter how the rest of the performances went. Well, I had no idea that every city we traveled to, there was gonna be long lines out the door to see us, that eventually the club started billing us as a headliner. I still don't know why, but... So, back in Austin, my producer called me over and played the symphony, and it actually sounded really, really good. So we jumped for joy, and then later that year, I released my first symphony to coincide with a documentary about that experience in New York, where they're getting drunk, and the CD got airplay on NPR, BBC, College Radio, and the film would screen at 50 festivals, one of which had a conductor sitting in the audience, and he offered to actually premiere it live in Ohio. So, at the end of 2013, I finally made that jump to LA. Remember I talked about wanting to go to LA after college. So, thinking I wanted to be a big time film composer at this point, but my heart wasn't in it. So I was searching for meaning, and I wanted to make an impact with my music, so I decided to try and incorporate my music into a project that would give back to the community. This is where I came up with the Six Piano Project, for which I would find free pianos on Craigslist, restore them, have a concert at my house with all six playing at the same time, and then donate them back to underserved communities and schools. This project was my most gratifying to date, and it made me realize that music can actually change lives. And so I tried the Six Piano Project here in San Antonio, and it too was a success, in my opinion. And based on this, after years of contemplating, I decided to move to San Antonio this year. I see San Antonio as an open canvas, and a city that is my symphony. I essentially want to play the city. I've begun this process by starting a community street choir from those who follow the echoes. It's made up of dedicated singers of all levels, ages, and backgrounds. And the idea is to reimagine spaces in the city. So I ask myself, how can we see San Antonio in a different way? How can we present classical music in a fresh way? How about an opera on the bus? How about a choir singing around you while you skydive or while you watch a Pechacucha? I truly believe that anything goes in San Antonio. The music has brought me here, and I'm thrilled to be part of this creative movement in San Antonio. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. That was, that was awesome. Um, First of all, who are your uh, collaborators here? You want to give a shout out to your... Uh... Absolutely. Uh, we have Veronica, Nisa, and Kelly who are part of the choir um, from those who follow the That's awesome. Others. All right. And now, just because you're a newbie from San Antonio, are you insecure? Do you have something very important in that bag? Or is, is there... Did you expect some kind of thievery here or the thuggishness of <laughs> when I moved, looting? We're not in Houston. When I moved... I'm sorry. Too soon. <laughs> I was trying to be topical. He said it. He said I'm it. saying that because my daughter is working in Houston right now. She lives in Houston, and she's at a hospital, so please take, forgive me for that. That was, that was pretty horrible, wasn't it? Okay. I feel like I just tweeted at 3 a.m. on my golden throne. Okay. So anyway, I left Austin first. Why did you decide here versus Austin? Because a lot of people wonder. San Antonio has that special energy that I felt 
when I was growing up in Austin in the early 90s as a kid. And I started coming to Southtown about four, five, six years ago, and everyone just kind of opened up their, their hearts to me and showed me around. I have a, one of my best friends from Austin was here first. And yeah, yeah it's an amazing city. I mean, I think there's room to. And how about after all the rejection, did you ever think, <laughs> hey, I, I got to get a, you know, a real job or something like that? I mean, uh... well, the thing is, that I don't think anyone really wants me to work for them. So <laughs> it's kinda... I know how that feels. Yeah. OK. And uh, so, the, so what was the secret when you decided when you really got that big break? Was it going to China? Was it uh, how, how did what was that one tipping point for you? Um, I kind of like to think that I haven't really found my big break yet. It's, that's what I've learned through this process. It uh, keeps me hungry, you know? So. And now the Six Piano Project that was here in San Antonio, is it still going on? Or is there something like that you'd like to keep going? Yeah, I did it in Barcelona in April, and I'm doing it in Melbourne in November. So yeah, it has, it's starting to have legs and just kind of... Wow. You know, and now where, where can people hear your symphonies aside from here? Um, well... Hopefully the San Antonio, or, or buy them. San Antonio Symphony, maybe? Right, San Antonio Symphony. Anybody here with the San Antonio Symphony have a little, anybody have a little pull, <laughs> Bob Rivard? Anybody have a little uh, influence, their own little media? Outfit? It's a big media outfit, I'm sorry. It, uh, but that's cool. So have you talked to them about that? No, I, I'm ready for them to talk to me, so I'll, I'll, I'll just being honest. Uh, is it, is, and how about uh, just a couple last quick questions here? How, how would you describe your symphonies coming from the background of a guitarist? You mentioned uh, Glass. Uh, who's 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 your your mentor? Your your um, spirit animal? It kind of changes all the time. You know, it's like one day you like sushi, and the next day you like ramen. So one day I like, you know. Could somebody get me a Ziploc baggie full of something that I can? All right, man. You're right. You're from Austin. Okay, so, but is there any particular? Your orchestration includes. Um, I really like. Um, see, I'm blanking on the name. I'm bad with names. Uh, he was a Polish composer. Um, Goretzky. Goretzky. I like that guy. I loved him. He was. A, he, you know, on the dream, uh, the the hockey thing back in the day. Um, and did you seriously hum the parts? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what else do you do when you can't write music, right? You do TV. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, William Jack Sibley. Thank you for staying in San Antonio. And.